Yes, Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have just come back, welcome. For those of you who have just come in, welcome. This is the first brown bag lunch interview of the Puppets in the Green Mountains Walking to the Borders Festival. Um, you can see that we are set up for our, our interview here. And uh, just to energize the conversation, we want to start with an art burst. And so uh, Crystal Brown, who's about uh, to speak with John and Paul and all of you, uh, will open this interview with a performance. Crystal Brown. race never goes well. <laughs> I keep getting caught up and energized by something that gets me nowhere but the places I've already been. My race is so long. I don't know how to train for marathons, but I've been taught this got a lot to do with birth control, and it's a mind game. But the games that attack the minds of others are not the same. This race gets wider and deeper and more treacherous, depending on the area you live in. Stuff you acquire, the skill sets you need. Sometimes it's more like a obstacle course than a race. Sometimes it's more like survivor than a actual track. Sometimes you don't know if you're the hunter or the hunted. But the race keeps going. And you find different things to feed off along the way. I was really good in high school at sprinting, so this long-term thing is hard. You know, I'm good for 100 yards or so. But after that, I just fizzle out, like most people, I guess. And then, the longer the race gets, the more things I have to carry with me. I got a kid on my back. I got a mortgage on my back. I got my community on my back. They don't make packs big enough for all that. Not even Patagonia. <laughs> so I'm wondering, if I don't make it to the end, if I never cross the finish line, 
how do people know where to go next? Which race will my son run? Will my nephew graduate from college? Will my 73-year-old mother, who sat at lunch counters in Greensboro, North Carolina in the 60s, feel as though something has really changed? So I have no choice to, but to be in the race. But I don't know if I'll ever really win. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. My name is John Potter, and in a former life, I was the arts editor of the Brattleboro Reformers Ovation Section. Uh, in a current life, I am the executive director of the Latches and a longtime resident now of Brattleboro, uh, and just about as long a fan of Sandglass Theater, and very honored and happy to be here and happy to see all of you here. So with me uh, right now are Crystal Brown, whom you uh, met through her uh, absolutely beautiful movement just a few minutes ago. She is chair of dance at Middlebury College and a founder of InSpirit Dance Company among many endeavors, and we'll find out a little bit more about that very soon. And uh, further on down the road is Paul Zaloom, who many of you may have seen last night. Um, I'm describing him as a puppeteer, political satirist, performance artist, uh, and someone who bites the hand that feeds him, I think, a little bit. But um, it was quite a performance, and thank you very much uh, for, for that last Thanks. night. So um, we are here to talk about race, and there has never been an inconsequential time to talk about race. It has been with us as a nation uh, from the very beginning and before that. And Thomas Jefferson described slavery as the wolf we were all holding by the ears. We didn't know what to do. And we just knew we couldn't put it down or do anything with it. Uh, so it's never been uh, far from the forefront and it's never been inconsequential. It seems um, very much in our day and age uh, now to be particularly consequential. We have had uh, nationwide a spate of uh, really troubling and tragic uh, occurrences and uh, not only individual events but really, really grim statistics about uh, employment and economic success uh, that seem to uh, draw the lines along race. Incarceration, the list goes on. In the, in, uh, the earlier talk here, um, the word Baltimore came up and we all knew uh, that had meaning for us beyond a city and a place because of what happened. If you say the word Ferguson, uh, that has uh, evocative meaning. Uh, so I think uh, now is particularly apt. It, it is certainly running through our political debate uh, already in very many ways. Uh, I think bottom line is um, going to the words of historian and scholar Barbara Fields, who found six words to describe uh, I think what is going on when she said racism has been America's tragic flaw. So we are here to talk about race and I would like, but before we do that, I would like to um, give both artists a chance to talk a little bit more briefly about their work in case you haven't, uh, haven't, seen, uh, haven't seen the work or had much experience with them. So Crystal, would you please tell us sure. what you do? Uh, I do a lot of things. <laughs> I'm a recovering workaholic, so I do a lot. <laughs> um, I chair the dance program at Middlebury College, um, which is up the road from here, about two hours. Um, and I'm the artistic director of a company called InSpirit, which has now morphed into more of a production uh, and project-based company, which is touring a work called The Opulence of Integrity, which is um, a direct shift to what I had been doing with my company for 10 years. For 10 years, InSpirit was an all-female ensemble that created work for one another to perform to perpetuate the work of emerging female choreographers. 
Um, and in recent years, um, as I was telling John on the phone, I like to say having a son shines light on things that you never knew were there, um, mostly your flaws and the gaps in your own understanding. Um, so then I started um, an all-male company, a project called The Opulence of Integrity, like, I'm saying, like I said, and it's based around the life and legacy of Muhammad Ali. So now I tour with uh, seven men instead of ten women, uh, which is different. <laughs> <laughs> Much different. Um, um, and uh, in, in addition to that, um, I create uh, work all over the country for students um, and different arts organizations. I'm really trying to participate in the dialogue that I think the companies that I work for and the canon that I find myself in, coming from companies uh, like Chuck Davis's African American Dance Ensemble and Urban Bush Women and Bill T. Jones, really kind of catalyzing my experience through their artistic voice and putting that forth into the world. Paul? Uh, yeah, it's funny you should mention uh, Muhammad Ali because he was one of my heroes when I was a kid, uh, when he was Cassius Clay and when he was hated so much by white people, which uh, made me really love him because he just pissed off people so bad and, and his pride and, and his strength was really, uh, really fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm a puppeteer and uh, political satir, satir, blah, blah, blah. And I got to puppetry from being in the Brent Puppet Theater, uh, currently of Glover, Vermont. I was introduced to the theater when I was a child of 19 and a student at Goddard College. And uh, I'm a lifer, and um, I'm happy about being a lifer. I'm not incarcerated, as <laughs> we heard earlier talk about incarceration. But anyway. Not yet. Uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a good it's a good little prison to be in, um, and I uh, because I came from Bread and Puppet, my work has always kind of um, been centered on political and and later on kind of social trends and um, you know criticism of different things going on in the society, uh, and I departed from Bread and Puppet because I the shows weren't funny enough for me, uh, you know always Schumann always says to me too much stuff. And I, I say to him, not enough jokes. Uh, so I, you know, that's my, that's you know, my religion, and my faith and everything. Uh, and and I also got interested in the, in some kind of natural way because I think of um, Klaus Oldenburg or Warhol or heroes of mine when I was a kid. So thus, Marcel Duchamp and getting to the ordinary object, this puppet, which all seemed like totally obvious to me, and, and doing that, and then evolving to doing shadow puppet shows and hand puppets and uh, 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 rod puppets and some little shitty marionettes and <laughs> other stuff which I'm forgetting, um, out with ventriloquism, uh, just as a part of a exploration of what was possible um, and what's interesting uh, to me. Um, and I, I mean, I really love puppetry because you can do pretty much anything you want on a, on a low budget and um, nobody takes it seriously and, and that's really great. And um, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's how I got here today. Thank you, thank you. Let's, um, let's jump right in and talk about your work in the context of what's happening um, right here, right now in our society. Uh, you, you both have been doing what you do for a while, um, but I'm curious as to what, um, what effect or how events today are influencing you, your thoughts, uh, maybe your approach to performing it or an appreciation of, um, of what you've been doing in a new light. So um, jump in either one of you, but if you could talk about uh, what's happening today, how it's making you feel as an artist and, and, and what you're seeing as an effect on your work. Well, I think uh, I was not trained as a black dancer. And I know that for some people that may seem like, well, of course not, you're just trained as a dancer. But there are two very distinct worlds in the dance field. There's contemporary dance and then there's black dance. Um, and I was not trained by what I look like. I was trained as a white dancer for, you know, because there is no white dance. I, you know, we'll get into that later. <laughs> but I was trained. <laughs> I was trained as a white dancer. Um, and so when I graduated from my undergrad and went into the field to try to find a job, um, there were only certain things that were available to me. Um, and it didn't matter what my skill set was. It really mattered what this body looked like in the context of telling other people's stories. Um, and so 
um, what I found is that I became, I had a, there was a little, a bit of a niche because I was the black girl who was trained as a release dancer. And so I got a lot of gigs for being unique. Um, and so what I have realized over the years is that that training gave me a little bit um, of an out in terms of dealing with what the constructs were around me that were prohibiting me from doing certain things and that were kind of touting me as another thing. So, you know, I still walk down the halls of Middlebury sometimes and people think I'm a student or I'm the visiting African dance teacher, right? I'm, all, I'm one of the only, uh, one of two as of January African American females on the faculty of the entire college. So, um, everything about me um, precedes whatever comes out of my mouth, right? So, uh, it doesn't, until people see me move or hear me say, hi, I'm Crystal, there's a different connotation that they're, um, that they're, may, that they're assuming I am, right? So the way that that's influenced my work is that I've really started to think of, um, I was talking to John a little bit about this on the phone earlier, what I've really started to think of myself is as a resource corridor, right? And so I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of. I know what the assumptions are. And so I need to figure out a way to use those not only in my favor, but so that they proliferate an opening for other people behind me, right? So in terms of that, what I'm starting to see my work as is a way that I, as, you know, for a, for a lot of people, as um, um, the smart black girl they know, there are lots of us, I'm, you know, but I'm the one they know. It's, I'm close. I can say things to a lot, a lot of people that other people can't say. I can say, to my son's uh, friends, mothers, that I know that it's okay for him to throw tantrums because you want him to express his emotions, but Gabe can't do that because in 10 years he'll be arrested or shot for doing that. So next time, just like call, just send him to me, right? So I can say things, I can have those hard conversations with a lot of people that are not broached in other situations, and I have those in education as well. Um, so my work has turned into this kind of translation, if you will, of the embodied knowledge of a person of color inside a prestigious white society that then kind of levels the playing field from an artistic medicine in the candy perspective. So that's kind of what we, what, what my work has turned into over the years. Yeah. I like that medicine in the candy <laughs> thing. I, I, that's, I, I get that. Uh, I, I'd like to just talk um, about the thing I'm sort of most anxious to talk about, which is the genesis of my show, White Like Me, because uh, I think it's kind of an interesting story. Um, there's this National Performance Network, which is a series of venues across the country that, uh, you know, provide resources and there's touring, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, one of the things that happens is that artists get up and they pitch their projects and they try to get venues on board to book them or co-commission or whatever. And so it's in two days and day one, uh, I, I was on for day two, thank goodness, I'm really happy for that. So on day one, you know, people got up and made their pitches, and there were a number of people of color who got up and made pitches that were, uh, to varying degrees, were about their identity or their experience as Latinos or as African Americans or Asians. And I saw this sort of happening, and I'm sitting there and I said to myself, well, what about me? <laughs> and then I sat there and said, that's fucked up. <laughs> so that's like really fucked up. And, and it's really interesting. It's like really interesting. So the next day I was going to pitch this idea of doing a show about lying. And that hit the shitter right away. And by that night, I had a title, White Like Me. Um, and I had to pitch the next day, you know, I, I just all sort of fell into place. And uh, I think part of what really interested me in it was the idea of uh, we white folks see ourselves, as I say in my show, we are normal, we look normal. You know, you are not normal. <laughs> because what we're, you know, it's what we're used to. We're used to, we don't walk around saying I'm white unless we're in the KKK or the Nazi party. You know what I mean? And it's not you, like you walk in a room of white people and you say, oh, look at all the white people. It's just look at all the people. And then if there's an African American, it's look at all the people, oh, and that black person. So I, I think that's really interesting. And I've been in some situations in my life where I have been a minority, very few, 
Uh, I went to a Black Panther meeting when I was 16 years old that some of my African-American friends took me to, and that was kind of excruciating and interesting. Uh, I remember going to an opening in Westminster uh, in Orange County where it was a, a Vietnamese-American artist and looking around and saying, uh, oh, um, you know, I'm the only Caucasian here. And uh, just to give you a sense of what I was interested in, in terms of the idea of whiteness, <laughs> this is really a sick story, so don't help me, don't hate on me for this. But my, my husband and I were in a shopping mall that's near where I live, and it's a um, Filipino shopping mall. And so the place is filled with Filipinos, and I, my, my husband is uh, uh, um, ethnic Chinese, I grew up in Singapore, and so we're standing there and I turned to him and I said, man, we're the only two Caucasians here. <laughs> so that explains in a way that idea of how Caucasians think about race. It's us against them. We are normal, they are not normal. Uh, yeah, so um, that's, that's, that's how I got to, to this place and wanted to make the show. Um, I could talk more about the gnarliness of what it meant and all of that, but I'm going to just be quiet. One of the words, Crystal, that came up when you, you and I talked before was dichotomy, and you, um, you brought that up a number of times. Uh, I was struck, uh, as, as you did just now, describing y y your life in a, a, at Middlebury College. Um, a, a seat of um, many great things, but also a seat of wealth and privilege. Uh, it happens to be in the whitest state in the Union. Um, and, you know, you have found a way um, to sort of navigate those dichotomies. But if, if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe that kind of creative tension in your life or the dichotomies you've encountered and how you uh, experience those and, and turn those into your work. Uh, um, I think I've experienced them in, in a, I mean, a plethora of ways, but <clears throat> the dichotomy of um, kind of if I'm this, then I can't be that. Like, if I am a dance professor, then of course I don't whip and nay nay. Yes, I do. <laughs> right? Like, this idea that I have to be either, either or um, for other people to be comfortable in how they interact with me. Right? So, um, figuring out where people's comfort levels are. But again, being trained by those icons I mentioned before, I've learned to meet people where they are. Um, and I don't expect you to know everything that I know or do everything that I do in the way that I do it. And I, I, I take that into my, into my studio time with my students as well. You're not, you're not gonna enter the precipice of this studio and all of a sudden become a 36-year-old black woman who's been dancing since she was nine and raised by a Vietnam vet and a bank teller. You're not gonna know that. That's in my body, that's in who I am. All that comes out um, with the way that I walk down the street, with the way that I you know, wake up in the morning. All those things are, are connected in a way that I can't teach those things. But what I do try to do in my work is knowing that there's so many parts of myself, I wanna try to acknowledge those in other people and teach them to do that with other people that they meet, right? So that there is no dichotomy. There's not an if or then, there's just a kind of a, a multiple interpretation of everyone and that all people's parts are, become valid. Um, and I think that dance is one of the ways that, you know, that, you know, you know I kind of feel like I'm on a covert mission right now. I'm like the dancer in the room. That's another thing, right? So, um, like the body is one of the ways we do that, right? Um, and figuring out how to get those stories out of this one thing that we have to live in, feed, train, you know, share with other people, and then find some semblance of self after all that's over. You know, at the end of the day, like that, you know, famous phrase, at the end of the day, you never know. At the, right, at the end of the day, you want to be whole. Um, and I think where the dichotomy comes in is that when you, when you leave that place of self, you often have to fracture yourself to make other people comfortable, right? And so I'm really just thinking that in, in the work that I'm making now, with opulence, right? With opulence, for me, it's so many things. It's the life and legacy of Muhammad Ali, but for me, it's really how do people continue to strive for their own greatness when people stop believing in it, when it's not comfortable for other people? How do you put seven black men on a stage and, not, and have them transcend assumption 
and let them live out their greatness in front of people rather than their greatness be diminuized for the perspective of the proscenium stage. How do you stop, how do you do that, you know? And so that's kind of where, where, where I'm struggling with now and that, and because um, black men or African American men in this country are at this point an endangered species, it's the, it's, that's, that's my entry point. Like that's where I go. Here's one right now. <laughs> yes. Can I watch a movie? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Uh. I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Well, it, it was more related to um, something that Crystal and I had talked yeah. about. I was going to um, shift gears and talk about um, outcomes that you guys uh, hope to achieve from from your work. And you know, I've always wrestled with even asking that question. It, in some ways, it reduces art to um, a commoditization. How many units of something do you hope to uh, get out at the end? Uh, nonetheless, um, I am curious as to um, you know, what effect and what um, movement or change or um, <laughs> um, uh, effect you hope to uh, have on your audiences. So, and Paul, maybe you'd like to start with that. Well, uh, uh, you know, people say to me, oh, your message, I love your message. I, I don't feel like Western Union. You know, I, I just don't, that message thing. Uh, but it would be disingenuous for me to say there isn't something I'm trying to articulate. I mean, I, a lot of things piss me off. I don't know how to do anything about it except make art about it, make jokes about it. And then my hope is that people also can get sort of liberated by that. Because I think people of partic my particular political ilk can get very depressed and very, you know, calcified and like, oh my God, everything. And I think it's really good to have a good laugh about it. It's just, uh, it's, it's just really good and therapeutic. So in terms of what I want, I want people to have a good laugh and have a great time. That's really number one. And it's really cool too if people can have a new way of looking or thinking about things. And that's what interests me about this piece right now you know, as an artist, you really, I think in a lot of ways, I look to find something in the culture that I don't find particularly expressed. You know, I, I say, oh, that hasn't really been exactly expressed in a way that I think I could do that. And the idea of, you know, we white people being people, you know, just generic people and everyone else being the other uh, was something I didn't quite, uh, so I, but the question of like what you want to have happen is really an interesting one because my show is in two parts and the second part is clearly uh, it's like a faux history of white man and in a lot of ways so that accomplishes what I want to say about anxiety about becoming a minority and about some of the things I mentioned earlier about the other but the first part has been the most difficult and challenging creative thing I've ever done because it's about me and a vent dummy who's been hidden away for a long time and he comes and he's learning about all the things that have changed. And I, I just have been tortured by what am I trying to say? What am I trying to do? What am I trying to accomplish with this? And I, I think part of it is because the area of race is so fraught already, it's so lo loaded already that I don't, you know, I see all these pitfalls and everything else. And I'll tell you what was, a turning point in the process for me was seeing that essay, I think by Peggy McGuire, I think her name is, it was written in 1988, and it was about 50 privileges that white people have. And I went down the list, and it's about, like Eric N just talked about, it, it's, it's, it's not me and them, you know what I mean? It's, oh, the black people this, and this is what happened to them, and now this is what, I, all of a sudden it's like, no, wait a minute, this is what happened to me, this is what, this is how I benefit. I was like, oh yeah. And you know, in a lot of ways, like, duh. But I read that, and that became very important to the show. The privileges I have been afforded, and trying to reflect some light on that. So it's semi successful. I'm going to keep trying to get it right. But uh, it's, been, it's been fun, you know, reaching for it. If I could just reflect a little. Um the, uh, the, your, the ventriloquist half of your piece, uh, I had, um, my reaction to it was one of, 
uh, sort of profound realization, but not really being able to articulate what that realization was about. It was an aha moment that I then struggled last night when I went home to explain to my wife other than I had this moment. So um, I think in some ways uh, that may reflect back what you, how, how you were talking about it now. But it does have that effect even though um, you know, the thoughts you can form, formulate around it are not fully formed, but it has a, has a powerful effect. Um, that was my experience of it. Maybe some of you had a, had a similar one who saw it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So, Crystal, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's different, you know, I, I'm sure you feel the same way, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, um, that from so many, there's so many levels to this. From an artistic level, you want your work to be seen, you want it to tour, you want, you know, from a creative level, you want it to thrive, you want it to be feeding you while it's feeding other people. And then, on another level, you want to be, you want it to be seen by people who who would not necessarily get the opportunity, right? So um, a lot of our tour right now is made up of Kickstarter campaigns just to get the piece into places that wouldn't be able to purchase it, right? So making sure that we're not just putting this piece on stage for the privilege to be able to see or the people who already understand the cataclysmic power of art need to put it in places where people don't see themselves or reflections of themselves on stage. And for kids of the new generation who have no idea who Muhammad Ali is and what kind of, uh, kind of controversy the name itself stirs up and the kind of freedom or the, the courage that people are using his legacy for their own lives to build. Like people are using the Ali legacy to fight their own battles with cancer. I mean like when I started to do this research, there were just so many things that, that came, to, came into play of, you know, personally for my father who lost his legs on his second tour in Vietnam um, and Ali having the, the gumption to say, I'm not going, take everything you want, but I'm not going, right? Um, and knowing that my father didn't have that right. He didn't have that privilege, or at least he didn't think he did, right? He didn't, he wasn't courageous enough to do that. So I want the work um, to really imbue a sense of courage in other people, to really find not only the greatness that they want to strive for for themselves, but in other people and be able to foster that and have the conversations that are, that are hard um, to be able to get to the next place. So that the 50 years that you're re referring to in the ventriloquist part of your show, doesn't become the same 50 years where people assume we've made so much progress and nothing has really changed. Yeah. Could you expand a little on where you've, where you've taken the show that um, um, access was allowed that uh, because of your work that yeah. um, maybe it wouldn't have gone? Yeah. Uh, with Most recently we just put it in a um, theater um, called Joe's Movement Emporium in, um, in Maryland, in Rainier, Mount Rainier, Maryland. Um, and they're kind of a small community theater um, and they can't afford to like, yes, yes, please bring this, we'll pay for it, don't worry, you know. Um, so what we did is we sent out a, a lot of a lot of emails and Kickstarter requests to a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues at Middlebury, really, um, and we raised five thousand dollars to be able to get the dancers there. And you know, I, luckily, I have some really amazing dancers who are like, "Yeah, we just need to get there. Let's do it." You know, like they're down whatever, for whatever. You know, like two of them have their own company called Brotherhood Dance. Another one has a company called Dante Brown Warehouse, um, and so they're really invested in the change for themselves because it's their legacy that they're that they're unearthing as, as well. Like in this work, um, I've heard them tell many stories about their own transformation just by doing this work and studying the legacy of Ali for themselves and really trying to chart a lane for themselves in the world, like really carve out a space where the black male is accepted for whatever they are. Um, many of them are, are, you know, are of mixed descent, right? So it's not just African American men, they're Hispanic men in the work. They're all these men of color. My lighting designer who is, an, who is amazing, Nick Hung, who's an Asian, Asian uh, man of color. So all of these people who are kind of surrounding the work are really making a container for what they want to change for themselves. Yeah. Paul, could you talk about humor and um, the power of that and, and the humor as a tool in work? Uh, well, I, I, uh, uh, one of my big influences, aside from Alexander Calder with the circus and Duchamp and Klaus Oldenburg and 
is uh, Lord Buckley, Lord Richard Buckley, a beat comedian from the uh, 50s. Uh, and I was listening to H-Bomb before I um, did the show yesterday. He was a guy who appropriated black, he was a uh, Caucasian, he appropriated black, like, jazz language and phony baloney English uh, pretensions and all that to retell the stories of Jesus of Nazareth called the Naz and the story of um, Gandhi, the spinning wheel. Anyway, he quotes, uh, H-Bomb is one of my favorite pieces and it's all about if we just get the world to laugh at the bomb, you know, that if we'd laugh, if we'd laugh at the bomb, that would be it. And he, he quotes Lord Boothby, who I, I actually don't know who he is, but Lord Boothby said that humor is uh, the solvent to, uh, to relieve tension and terror. I thought that that's an interesting quote. And then Buckley says in that shtick, he says, it is the duty of the humor of any given nation to attack the catastrophe that faces it in such a manner that the people laugh at it so they do not die before they get killed. <laughs> and, um, uh, say, it, say it again. <laughs> <coughs> well, I, I, I will tell you privately, maybe. Uh, uh, but it's, it's basically, uh, it's really interesting. I'm sort of very pessimistic, but also very optimistic. I mean, he was, you know, he was a really beautiful, beautiful poet. And, you know, it's called People, the Flowers of the World. And he talked about God, you know, being on the San Bernardo Freeway. And the, his car broke down. He says, I don't know about that Jehovah cat. But he says, and my, my car is broken down, and then the, this car pulls up, and inside's a big god and a little god, and they help them fix his car, and you know, off he went. So it's actually a, it's a very Quaker idea. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, humor, I, I mean, I just, I believe in it. It's, it's great, and it increases oxygen, and you know, all this great stuff. So. And, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I'm preaching to the converted because I don't like the idea of being a preacher. Sometimes I say, oh, I'm a USO tour for the left, you know, because they need, like, encouragement and all of that stuff. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I just want people to laugh and have a good time and go home and say it wasn't a waste of 20 bucks. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on, on humor and... and use in your work? Or? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So Opulence is the all-male piece. Um, on the other side of that, I do a one-woman show called The Life Cycle Series. Um, and there are many moving monologues where um, humor is the, the crux of it, right? Um, and it's easy to make, uh, it's easier for me to do those about myself. Um, because I can laugh at myself. It's like, oh, yeah, I've gone through that. Now it's funny. You know, when you're in it, not necessarily. Um, so um, there's several uh, kind of incarnations. There, there's one particular one that um, is called I'm fine. And it just keeps using the phrase I'm fine to denote how people uh, really just want to hear you say that, even if you're not fine. Um, and it charts this kind of, the probably the two years after I had my son. Um, and if you can imagine, I mean, you, it, pregnancy is hard for anyone, but a dancer, to then have to give over their facility to an alien <laughs> who's taking them over minute by minute and you can't fit, you can't you don't know if you want to pee or if you want to laugh or if you want to get your, your leg won't move like it's supposed to all these things right so it all after um, all that it was this period where people just kept saying how are you and I just kept saying I'm fine <laughs> fine fine and so there there's this uh, solo called I'm fine you can watch it on YouTube if you like yeah. um when you were performing before, you were talking about the long race yeah. and in reading about uh, what's going on in our, in our society right now, um, there have, were articles on the battle fatigue that African American communities and maybe all of us feel about um, what the work that needs to be done. And I'm, I'm curious as to um, what sustains you? How do you, both of you, how do you, um, I mean, your piece talks about a 50-year um, time jump and puts that in. So uh, where do you find sustenance to keep uh, doing what you do and, and um, keep talking about this? Uh, well, you know, Lord Buckley. Uh, what else? My grandchildren. 
uh, you know, pretty flowers. I don't know, feeling extremely grateful really helps. You know, I'm very blessed. I could croak tomorrow and I had a great fulfilled life. So having a good attitude, I'm naturally, a, you know, a pessimistic dick, but, uh, <laughs> You know, if I get on the optimism tip, and you know, it takes a lot of work, let me tell you, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm more in like Satan's corner than <laughs> the, the jolly God. But anyway, uh, and also, you know, it was interesting, I, I was uptight about the show yesterday, and then I put in uh, Jeff Beck, you know, the uh, early Jeff Beck with Rod Stewart and all that, and I listened to it, and it's been my favorite music since I was a kid. And it was like, boom, all that tension and everything went away. It was like, you know. So there's a billion different ways to uh, chill out and relax. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think about Lord Buckley before I hit the deck. You know, what would the Lord do? <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, I, I think what keeps me sustained is the idea of legacy. It's always been something that's nagged at me. Um, <coughs> And one of my dear mentors, Blondell Cummings, just passed away about a week and a half ago. Um, and for those of you who don't know who she is, um, feel free to read the New York Times article about her passing. She was a, a really, really huge force in the dance world. Um, without her being here, I wouldn't be here. Um, and so that idea of legacy is really important to me. That um, Blondell was so instrumental in a lot of people's lives. Artists like Meredith Monk and artists who have gone on uh, to be in books and have large careers. Um, but she, no one knew her name. And, I mean, not no one, but you know what I mean? She wasn't, um, she wasn't as well known. Um, and so the idea of legacy for me is very important because I've seen dancers and choreographers um, leave this world with nothing. Um, and I'm not gonna say it's not fair. Life is, you know, fair is, uh, is, is relative. Um, but for people to make such dynamic changes in other people and not be known for that is, is hard. So um, the idea of legacy keeps me going that, um, not that people need to know my name, but that the names will be known. You know, like I will keep saying them. Um, they will become important for other reasons, um, and that something will be different when I leave. It might not be perfect. It's not all, not may not be all good, but there will be something that has shifted. And whether that be in my dance career, in my dance family, in my students, or even just in my legacy, I think even just in my legacy as um, my family. You know, like if I leave here um, and my son graduates from college. That's a shift in my family's legacy. He will be the first black man to ever graduate from college in my family. That's huge. So legacy is what sustains me. Something shifting along the way that has a, has a, makes a difference. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add, uh, I got into puppetry because of uh, Peter and Elka Schumann and the Bread and Puppet Theater, and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And we have been thinking a lot of what the legacy of the theater is and should be in the future because he's, you know, he's 80 years old. And I don't think I'm continuing that necessarily. I'm like the mutant offspring uh, that, you know, he would prefer, you know, disappear or whatever. Uh, because, you know, I, it, it's like that thing where you know, it's, I guess it's some edible thing. I, I don't know, but anyway, my, my work doesn't really, you know, ring true for him, and it's a generational thing and all that, and I could be bummed out and, or pissed off or something, but I, you know, I don't give a shit. He's like family to me, and I love him, and that's the most important thing, and all my brothers and sisters from the theater. And so we're trying to figure out what that legacy is. And I hope that my work and my colleagues, some of whom are here today, that our work is also a legacy, even if, you know, he doesn't see it that way. Uh, but you know, that we're, we're raising the banner of social, you know, action and political theater and puppetry and all the rest of it. So yeah, hooray for legacy. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to um, take this opportunity to turn, uh, turn the floor over to questions. And um, it's been asked that I repeat the question just so we all, we all can hear. So, um, but uh, now's the time to fire away. 
Yes, sir. Um, so my, my question is about um, puppets, because globally, puppets have been, and race, because puppets have been used to represent uh, ethnicity and gender, race, all over the place. And um, I, I had the opportunity to write a book about the Detroit Institute of Arts puppet collection, an American puppet collection started by Paul McCormick. And the largest single um, element of that is blackface puppets operated by, I think, mostly white puppeteers. And it's in the basement of the DIA. And in terms of the history of American puppetry, this is something that it's not talked about or analyzed. And even today, a lot of white puppeteers will operate black, oftentimes sort of caricatured black puppets in that, what to me is a minstrel tradition, but there's sometimes there's an amazingly lack of sense of that. But, but puppetry is a very interesting performance technique, and I, I don't know Crystal's work that much, but I, at all, but I think of um, dance in a way being much more like puppetry because in both situations you're working with bodies and, and movement on stage and rather than drama, which is text-based. But I wondered what you both might think about the possibilities of puppetry representing race, um, or you know, it could be ethnicity or gender, but puppetry re representing race because of this very special, special situation where as a manipulator or performer, you're not you're performing the other already. You're performing something else. You're not performing yourself. Does that create some possibilities or challenges? Thank you. The question was about puppetry and race and, and, and how they how that might work together. So, well, I you know my great grandfather was a minstrel player. He did blackface, uh, which is sort of simultaneously uh, something that I'm ashamed of in the sort of Ben, uh, what's his name, Affleck <laughs> sense. But then also, you know, I think it's kind of hilarious. You know, it's my background. Oh, blackface, wow. Uh, but what, uh, two things. One, I've never had an African-American uh, character because I, in my shows because I just wouldn't know how to do it. I just wouldn't. Now, oddly enough, in this show, I do have Latino characters. But that I'm more comfortable doing, and I, I don't know why. I have to think about that. I, it's less fraught in some way. I feel it's very fraught uh, for me to play an African-American character. Uh, you know, we just saw this Mamalengo piece uh, in the festival that, that John curated, and he brought this wonderful Brazilian puppeteer who had this show, and he is, uh, well, let's put it this way, he's, he's not black. The puppeteer, and he's got this whole host of different characters who are actually, uh, you know, kind of a variation of colors. But the hero is, in fact, a very dark black puppet. And I thought it was really interesting that he could get away with it, and he totally got away with it. And in part, it's because of the way the whole racial, uh, the, the whole construct there is different than it is in the United States. And I'm not saying it's more progressive and it's less racist, because it clearly isn't. You know, uh, darker skinned people in Brazil are more discriminated against. But it just is in a different context. Mm -hmm. And that allows him to make that character play. And it's not weird and messed up. So your question is, uh, I'm going home and I have to really think about that. So thank you for that, John. Um, I can think. I, uh, this is a, a, again an assumption um, because I'm not a puppeteer, but I've always watched it as an extension of the embodiment of the person. So I would imagine that if someone was operating the puppet and their, their own embodiment of culture was not intact or in line with what they were portraying, then it could be hard on many levels for many people. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, you know, I have experienced, so in the past year, I've taken some students to Trinidad and really explored this idea of masking in many cultures, Japanese Bouteau, Trin Trinidadian Carnival, and you know, all these kind of ways that we change the body to do something else. Um, and I had someone say to me, do you have those, it was for the Bouteau piece, do you have those kids in white face? <laughs> and I was like, 
No, actually it's Bouteau, but I could see where you're going with this. So, like, so the, the idea that there's this other, you know, this other thing that happens to the body, and in Bouteau it's more of an erasure of the self, right? It's more, it's not just about the color of it, it's really about moving the person out of the way so that the work can be seen, um, which is performance theory and dance, moving the person out of the way so the work can be seen. Um, so I think, I think th that's my reaction to your question in terms of what's the medium, um, how the, how the, the embodiment is being portrayed, and what's what's the um, what's the preparation for the portrayer? Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Crystal, I, I was so enchanted that you did not apologize for becoming emotional because it's so common in our culture, you know. So that labels you as a true revolutionary. And my, my question. My question is this, um, you know, you, you, you talked about your dad and you know, his leg being blown off and you said he didn't have the privilege of uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, but I'm wondering, and you don't have to answer this, uh, but I'm wondering if he had that mindset, you know, that he didn't want to do that yeah. and, and that he has expressed it to you. Well, he's deceased now. He, uh, he's been deceased now for about 15 years. Um, and. He did not express that to me, but I've been learning a lot about him through fragments of stories um, from family members that I haven't seen for 15 years as well. Um, and so what I, what I can deduce from the fragments that I know, um, and also thinking my brother and I were both born after my father lost his legs. So another part of that is I have no idea who the man was that my mother fell in love with. I just know the, the man who came back from the war. Right, so uh, some of that I still am trying to piece together. Um, and I assume he was drafted. Uh, that's also very interesting. Listen to this. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I just uh, I just found this out. No, he was not drafted. Um, he was um, guaranteed that he. My, my father was an athlete. He loved playing football, and so um, he was accepted to a college. They didn't guarantee him a spot on the football team. But the army told him he could play football. <laughs> so, hence his military career. Yeah. And then losing his legs and not being able to play at all. Wow. Right. Wow. So, yeah. And then you're a dancer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Legacy, exactly. <laughs> so um, I actually think, I don't know if he was of that mindset. I know that he was of the original mindset of Cassius Clay, who wanted something important to do to feed his family. Uh -huh. um, and so that's really what I understood just, I mean, literally two months ago when I sat down with his sister in Florida, um, and she told me, and that's when I first learned that he lost his legs on the second tour. I never even knew he went back again until two months ago. So just that kind of, you know, that kind of ideal, that, that mindset. Yeah, and then hearing a story that my mother told um, where she said that when she, when, they get, when she got the call from the hospital from him, his recount of the story, his retelling of the story went something like, um, yeah, and I saw the guy in front of me, babe, and then the first thing I, I saw a lot of blood, but the first thing I did was reach to my back pocket and see if I still had my money because, right, so he was really about, he was really about like quantifying the worth of the man, through, like, and it was deep, deeply ingrained, which is something we see in African American men to this day. Your worth is about what you have, not what you can give. And if you don't have it and you don't have it to give, then something about you is not manly. Right, so that and that was his first, the first thing out of his mouth. She said, and I was just like, "Oh my God, this is so deep. Like, what are we gonna do with this?" Yes, no, thank you. Um, hi. hi. Um, this is a complicated question. Maybe I'm gonna try to do my best to articulate it. <laughs> I'm wondering if either of you or all of you have perspectives about. Um, centralizing anti-racist dialogue about whiteness. I have like complex feelings about it. I'm not like one side or the other. Your answers won't be wrong. <laughs> Anybody's to me. But I feel like
got more space in the anti-racist dialogue as white people by centralizing our own narratives? Or are we taking up the space that we already have and kind of retooling that in a more positive way? Or like, what are other non-white perspectives on that issue? Maybe we don't have ideas about it, but it's like something that I wonder about for myself and trying to like use my work to the best and highest outcomes for social change. Yeah. So like, yeah, where does this refocusing on whiteness fit into our our roles as artists who are change makers? <coughs> You know, a lot of times people are, people have um, again assumptions about how where people sit on issues, right? So, I personally don't think it's taking up more space. I think that the spaces for the dialogue need to be intentional, if that makes sense. So, taking up space in the in in the life of the conversation is one thing, but where you where the space is counts for me more, um, and who's in the space with you. Right, so if we're not, if the dialogue is not inclusive of, of quote unquote other, then we're not moving anyone forward. Um, does that make sense? I feel, I just feel like it's not, it's, it's about whiteness and this, and this, I, I thought about this for a long time. I was actually engaged to an Italian man whose mother was a psychotherapist, a white woman who educated other white people about white privilege. And this, it blew my mind. This, I was like, what? what? How does that work? <laughs> you know, this was years ago, but I was just like, how does that work? What, are, are you like, are you getting in fights with people? Like, are you like, is this okay? Are you all right? Um, and it really just reshaped my idea of how people are influenced, right? And so there has to be a sameness and this is not about race, this is about intentionality, this is about social status. There has to be a sameness for people to even listen, right? There has to be a peer connection, right? There has to be a, I trust you on some level to even be able to hear your critique of something about me and that I will actually honestly believe because I could just brush this off of like, oh yeah, she's crazy, right? And move on. But if I have a connection, if we have a connection, if there's something about you that I respect, and you tell me there's something about me that's, that needs work, then I'm gonna listen. You know, so I think the spaces and the people in those spaces are more important to me than how the amount of people who are talking about it, you know? Well, I had an English teacher when I was in high school who was a acolyte of Martin Duberman. And uh, Duberman said something at the time in the late 60s about if you want to affect uh, social change, you should do it in your own community. Uh, so that had a big impact on me. Uh, and you know, plus I'm a white male. I know it's hard to tell, but uh, it's so laden with so much different stuff being a white male that I, I'm not even aware of all of it. And I'm, I feel in a way like going through life is like a minefield. I'm gonna make some sort of mistake or say the wrong thing. And, but I, I think really focusing on the white community and a communicate, you know, that just seems like it makes sense for it to be my mission. Uh, now having said that, I performed the show in Turkey and in Sicily and uh, in France. And I guess part of that, the, that end of the mission, is to kind of show people that not, you know, all Americans are assholes. Uh, that some of us, you know, it's, we don't think monolithically, we think in different ways, and we create work in different ways, and that's been important to do that. Um, and there is a desire on my part for people, Latinos and for African Americans and, and other people of color to see my show because I want them to see what the perspective is of one Caucasian. Now, I don't know why. I, I, you know, I don't want to prove to everybody what a great liberal I am or how. I just, I'm interested in people seeing what that perspective is and how that resonates or doesn't resonate. Uh, so last night, some of my colleagues who are here who are from Mexico and they're Mexican puppeteers, I'm, I actually really, treasure the fact they're in the audience because I get to talk a little bit and, and I get to have the 
Latinos in my show and you know my perspective, and I want to lay that out in front of them. Uh, so I, it's all a it's all a contradiction. Uh, but the bottom line is, I think there's plenty of bandwidth. It's just as a white male, we get to dominate everything all the time. We don't even know it. So in that sense, you know, <laughs> it's pretty tricky. Question. Next question. Okay. <laughs> you guys want to talk about uh, until the other? Oh, do you have a question? I don't have so much a question, but maybe again, stick with the room. Um, I, from Baltimore, I run a puppet slam in Baltimore. I love the puppet slams that we run in Baltimore. And um, initially, when we started, it was about creating space for people who don't identify as puppeteers, dancers. Um, other kinds of performance artists to find a new way of presenting work um, on stage. But what I've noticed over the last two years is that um, as we've been having more concrete conversations in the Baltimore arts community about how to be within our own arts community, um, wrap our heads around uh, the inequities and access to grants and access to venues and access to space. How do we utilize the Puppet Slam as a way to create community around those issues? And um, we have um, still very few uh, people of color who are participating in our Puppet Slams. And so when I went to the National Festival, one of the things that I was really aware of is how white the Puppet Festival was. And um, I was in conversation with a few people there about um, you know, the deeper issues of white supremacy, how systems are perpetuated against people who are, you know, someone I got into conversation with over, over lunch said, well, this is just representative who is interested in puppetry. And I thought there was a real lack of understanding about how systems are perpetuated. So I guess I'm curious to hear from, from Pope, um, Crystal and Paul or anybody else in the room, how do we grapple as a puppetry community with those underlying um, systemic problems, and because there are so many traditions that are connected to puppetry that I see in Baltimore. We have Caribbean stilt walkers, we have people that are dancers, we have people that are moving with objects, processions, um, but they don't identify as puppeteers and they're not on stage. And so I'm really grappling with how do I make sure that I can be in my community and I can bring my interest in puppetry to um, to to this issue of, of not having enough people of color. Because I feel like we're losing out in a big way. You know, it's not to increase diversity. We had that conversation in Baltimore. It's not about increasing diversity, because that's somehow, again, centered on us, on white people. It's about like we're really missing out on stories, on experiences, on people, on ways of expression, um, because we don't have enough representation of other viewpoints in the poetry community. So I would love for anybody to reflect on that. So the question was rep representation of the puppet and maybe by extension performance community or other artistic communities um, in general. And um, ma'am? I'd like to respond to that. And I don't, want to, I don't want to act as if I've got answers, so I just want to clear yes. I don't have answers. I have experiences. Um, I went to American Samoa, which is a completely different culture than the United States mainland. It is a US territory, but it's got its own Samoa. I was the crest on a wave. <laughs> there were very few that looked like me that came from a culture like mine. And the reason that I went and stayed, as opposed to going for two years, living on the ocean and then coming home, um, was that I had something to learn and I wanted to learn it. And when the way I think that your question can be addressed, and this is just one way, um, is to decide that you have something to learn. Not that, not that, and I, and I hear that implicitly in what you're saying, but I mean be explicit. When you invite people to participate, when you open up your space, when you examine yourself, and that's the first thing you gotta do and say, where did I learn this? What did I get that I didn't earn? You know, then you have something that you wanna include other people in. Why? Because they can teach you something and because you need to know it, and because you're never going to know it if you don't open the space up and put a way for other people to come in. So when you write a grant, you specify, and you may have to use the buzzwords, you know, in order to communicate to the people who are going to give you the money. But you specify, you know, we're interested in a shared 
opportunity here. We have people who would like you to give us a workshop because you've got stuff that you're doing that we want to know. We want to hear about. We want to participate in. And if you come with that open heart, and the Samoans would call it, you know, if you come with that open heart, people will come to you. You know, that's how to, that's how to bridge the artificial barriers that get constructed so that people in privilege stay in privilege and don't have to give it up. So the willingness is not so much here, let me give you some money. The willingness is, Tell me, tell me what I don't know because I grew up differently. Tell me what, what you can do that I can't do because that's really complicated. How the heck did you, you know, just be there, be genuine, be open and act as if you've got something that you, that you want to learn and people will come to teach you. That's, I mean, you know, sorry. <laughs> I that. Quick reflections before we wrap that up, anything else to? Uh, we've come to the end of Well, I would just say, I think in many ways we're, I don't know if you'd say it's a crisis in American puppetry, but uh, there's a lot of really shitty work out there, and there's not enough social, political engagement in the puppetry community. Uh, and a lot of shows are just pretty, and they're not really about something, and, you know, Puppetry has been about, you know, these characters like Punch and, and uh, Petrushka and Karagos and all the rest of them that were troublemakers. We come from a tradition of troublemakers and ball busters and, you know, wickedness and saying the things you're not supposed to say. And the authorities, by nature, are stupid and they don't make the connection between the puppeteer and the puppet like they do between the actor and the. You know, and and you know, it's almost the same person. But if it's a puppet, there's all oh, that puppet is so wicked saying that stuff. And yeah, I mean, I'm simplifying, but so this is our tradition: is is making trouble and being troublemakers and being naysayers and attacking the the catastrophe that faces us and the great dearth in our puppet community. And the curse is that there's not enough commitment and interest in that, that mission that has existed from day one of human experience jiggling uh, dolls. <laughs> Paul, thank you. Crystal, Paul, thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here. Can I just do one okay. I, just, I just want to give you an invitation. Um, so in about a month or so, uh, no, in about, take that back, in about two weeks, <laughs> time is flying. Uh, September 24th through 26th at Middlebury College, we're hosting a symposium called The Good Body. And if you want to continue this conversation about race, gender, uh, ability, disability, it's also centered around the 25th anniversary of the Americans for Disabilities Act. We'll have some keynote speakers who are of color and disabled and talking about the intersectionality of all their identities. Um, there'll be a keynote, per keynote lecture, lectures all day during the weekend, and, some, and a performance at the end. So it's just Clifford 2015 at Middlebury. If you want to Google it, the whole schedule's there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.